It is truly wonderful to start a piece of music that you have practiced and played often and discover how it reveals itself to you as a new friend. It's almost destabilizing because you're overwhelmed by the way it talks to you through its different voice leadings, its different charming harmonizations, surprising, or just a track on which you embark and like in an improvisation, well, while it's an interpretation, you faint that you don't know how it's going to end. Because it doesn't matter. What matters is how it's going to develop, unfold, blossom. This voice, this accompaniment, this secondary voice. Your attention is brought by the player more than by the music itself because it depends how much it's voiced or not. And then all of a sudden it takes another dimension in terms of the pace and the tempo combined with the quality of the singing capacity of the piano or the pianist, both legato, air legato, non legato. So is it these ingredients, I was wondering, or is it that even knowing the piece, we let ourselves immerse in its uh, narrative inspiration. Whimsical or nostalgic or driven or tragic or um, enigmatic or um, incredibly meditational, like as if you enter in a daydream which is somewhere you want to escape as well as some place from which you want to go to something like a climax or something that is a punctuation for your storytelling. And that's why I think it's so important that the performer doesn't always give the impression to the listener that he or she knows where all that leads to. It's a make-believe, like in theater plays, when there is a text and uh, audiences might know it, and those who don't travel with the escapism that the actor provides them to in a situation of rupture of disbelief that they enter in the character, they enter in the written text. In fact, the characters in theater animated texts, and so are the musicians. We animate um, uh, texts, notations, um, and then because perhaps of the acoustic or the mood or the situation, the piece reveals itself differently to you despite all the technical practicing to completely cover all unexpected. But unexpected always happens. And to be able to um, allow the piece to uh, reveal itself to you the way it will, the moment of the given performance, compared to preceding performances or compared to the future performances you will take some note from this one for. Yes, it's an obstacle course of details that you want to secure, but beyond there is the in-between the notes, the in-between the phrases, in-between the human breathing, not only the rhythmic organization of the breathing. So for that, of course, you have to know the piece from memory. It hardly works without, possibly with a score, especially because you can look at the score not for the notes, but it reminds you where um, the, nodes, the notes lead you to. And it's important in chamber music because people play with scores. It doesn't make them less inspired or less immersed. Now, I still think that playing from memory, or as we say, by heart, 
for by Saul is a way to appropriate the piece even more to yourself because there is no more um, paper between you and the audience. It's not apparently a recitation. It becomes a self-retold story. Or in some aspects, the piano's, the piano's playing or the pianist playing the piece for piano should or could and does appear so individual. But in fact, the pianist plays always many parts, at least two up to five or six, depending if it's what genre of music. But regardless, it's all about organization of thoughts organization of the elements, hierarchy, hierarchy as well. Ah, sometimes you say, I don't want to, especially in a fugue, all voices are equal. But in other pieces not, and besides music is not only fugues though. <laughs> but um, yeah, regardless, you can play very voiced in pieces which are not written as a fugue, which are not per se meant to be representative of the polyphony. Because there is polyphony in everything you play as a pianist and the reading of the score written on two staffs organizing the two hands per imposition brings a verticality in the reading when the individual um, parts are horizontal even if they're chordal they're not slices of cakes they're continuous of their ingredients, just that some appear on top and some overlap and there is a dialogue and sometimes is a uh, fragmented and sometimes even um, colli coll colliding voices in the expression of, for instance, Beethoven's fugues on the piano are collisions of the voices. Bach's voices on the fugue are the harmonious um, display of the voice leading. But it is true that even if you have already, unlike the students who discover the piece, been through several revisitations with that piece as a musician through the course of life, every time you rediscover the piece, oh, it's exactly like this, like a perfume that you smell and go, oh, I love this piece. It means perhaps more like I long for this piece or I played it too early now I really know what to appreciate in it it could be also I would like to hope that at some point before I die I'll play it as I dream it now why do we dream about an idealization that is possibly not worldly is possibly because it drives the human spirit towards the importance of touching, reaching, getting closer to something that is immaterial, just like the soul. Probably that's why, in part. I find that to be so true because success, capacity to win compared to people who lose in a competition or to have a career compared to those who don't, it's a lot of um, earthy facts besides learning how to play and then bonifying your playing through your life's experience. But ultimately you should not lock the door to um, how the piece reveals itself to you, perhaps, yes, you're familiar, you cannot ignore the fact that you can solfege it or play it, uh, you can sing it, you can whistle it, you can write about it, you know the purpose philosophically of it, so that's why you wonder, the more you build through the years an awareness of all the elements contributive to the grandness of the piece, the more you feel like afraid to disappoint yourself more than the piece itself, after all, 
many others will or did or will play it. It's just your moment. And I find that um, when I share the first visitation of a piece with a student, which I know for so many more decades obviously than them, I don't take any pride or any sense of superiority because of it. Not even because of the experience, perhaps some fingerings, perhaps some situations where you know what to avoid, where not to slow down because this or that is strategic things. Okay, that's, that's fair. You have to teach those things after all. You give them a shortcut. You can always say, you know, to yourself, it doesn't matter, they'll learn anyway. <laughs> but this way, you guide them so they hurt less of their um, wings around. But this, it's, it's important also for them to grow in the piece. You could give them also, as I try, um, aims at what to reach in terms of what to hear, what to bring out, what to read, what to read and therefore hear the reading in your inner ear and how to bring it out through your fingers and pedal feet obviously, with the feet as well. Um, there's something very brutal for some people who is which is the fact that you put yourself in question to the core of what you do. And even with experience, you have to practice every day. Relentlessly, humbly. And perhaps in the making of this practicing, you find the joy of the philosophers who say that the aim is the trip itself. Now that's something young people don't understand because naturally for them the trip is to get to play it, not to practice it. But with age they'll realize that there is a pleasure carving the piece as much as a pleasure displaying the piece. Though because it's not like uh, solid uh, forms of art, like sculpture or painting, for instance, photography, film, you rebuild the whole storytelling, the whole structure, you rebuild the whole piece from scratch every time you start again. And because pianists depend on different instruments wherever they go, uh, their action doesn't respond the way they are used to or they hope to. And so they have to adjust and adapt and all of a sudden the piece takes a different dimension, nothing but by the way it's touched to be played, not to mention it's heard through the resonances of the acoustics. It's possible to lock in a lot of the technical factors to uh, allow the least possible um, to be disturbed by the variation of the situation. But on the other hand, the listener hears that stiffness. It's an intellectual stiffness. If that's the price to be reliable in performance, then it's not worth it. though it's rewarding and reassuring and admired to be able to industrially perform the piece every night for a tour of I don't know how many months in I don't know how many countries and that's of course something that is very appealing to students who you know they study with a teacher but they admire the performer and it's not the same person most of the time if not all the time so, of course, it's very tempting for them too to, to project themselves in this uh, um, very um, glamorous situation, which is to be on stage, to be applauded. Perhaps it's a lot of narcissism in it, as well as some sense of achievement or recognition, or I don't know, perhaps 
everybody searches for something within their own um, psyche to find what satisfies them and what is completing their insecurity. But nevertheless, a lesson is no applause, is um, conviction and convincing and finding um, for the morphology of the very student's hand, arm and body, extraction of the sound, the best fingering or the best suggestion of position of the uh, hand so that you anticipate to enter in each section with the maximum quality to play all the notes as, as you define it should be repeated trills, arpeggios, echo, secondary voice, and all kinds of things. A lot is already said in the score, naturally, the text of the notes, the pitches and the rhythms, but also the indications, the phrasings, the additions, the additions differ, of course, between themselves. But I'd say that you can find a basic consensus and then comes your own personality. Ah, the rubato, not too much, but without it, it's not living. It's, it's, it's very mechanical, but then it depends on the style. If you consider the Baroque for this and the classical for that and the romantic for this and the modern for that, and then it becomes very defined and it becomes almost pedantic, which is a problem. In other words, you accumulate knowledge, but it doesn't make you play with more spontaneity. And spontaneity is often considered the opposite of professional, um, organized, um, I would say, controlled environment of the performance of the piece, no matter where and on what and when and how and jet lag or not. So perhaps there is a varnish on top of um, one's insecurities that is built by this experience and technique. But I think each time should be the only time. I know it sounds a cliche and I know nobody believes it, but I still believe it, believe it or not. Because that's when you touch the audience with a sense of yearning for the truth, the hope, the organization of the elements, the modulation, the transmission of this or that mood or transmission, translation. And it, because of that, I think it's important that um, one keeps humbly alert, detailed in the whole group of notes. organizing the phrases in the way of eloquent um, speech. The major problem is to make sure the students equally appreciate the silences of the rests, rhythmically written those, or those of the breathing of the phrase itself, imitating a singer, for instance. It's, it makes them nervous. They're nervous to be on stage, therefore they're ready to play, and play is action. Action is not think about the discomfort of being watched or listened to on stage because it's a problem of natural sense of reserve, of human way. So you have to either ignore, either be in a bubble, and of course you only stay connected to the piece as long as you play it. <laughs> But if the piece has resonances, okay, but also silences. They're as pregnant silences, as they call them in music terms, as um, just um, sighs, when they're just more relaxed silences. And you know, most of the pieces of classical music start with a silence when there is silence anyway between, before the piece starts, like the Liszt sonata. So how do you indicate to the audience through your playing in the performance that you play on the second and fourth beat and the first and third arrests when there is a rest before because it's silence? And what was the composer's um, 
idea to give this kind of formulas of pulse that are ambiguous and nobody knows if it's up or down beat so you're in sort of a limbo you expect you don't know it's mysterious or you're just in a moment of an ecstatic fact that you don't need a downbeat of beat not all music is march no waltz so they have have this kind of breath or holding and then releasing the note it's almost as if the rest is a dissonance and the note is the consonance of a tension release in harmonic melodic situation. Yeah, so you have to dialogue in the mirroring the notes in the rest and the rest in the notes. So they become, by their absence of sound, either a bridge connecting through or an interruption that brings you to, while playing, suggest to the listener that there is something going next, but we don't want to rush saying all the words at once in the storytelling. Those things are important because I find that um, at some point, unlike a conductor who by essence conductingly counts, <clears throat> Uh, pianists don't count much and sometimes when the texture, the complexity or the simply technical passage becomes very demanding they even stop breathing intuitively because they're just so attentive and careful at organizing these hands doing this and that and shifting and touching before they miss a note so everything is as if you try to control so many elements at the same time and hearing it is monitoring it, but projecting it is imagining it. And between the two there should be no disappointment. And very often the first note is, oh, it's too loud. Oh, why is it not sounding? Why didn't this note speak? Low action of the piano is heavier to depress than the high action, I mean um, the action of the higher register compared to the lower register. That is experience, agreed. And that's what I teach, to give my students the maximum capacity to be reliably secure in situations where they feel nervous, uncomfortable, to breathe, to, 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 to let the music become them and not to feel stressed on stage and afraid of the audience and afraid to disappoint their own practicing after all these years, hours and many more. No, it's to accept the moment and then let the piece speak think ahead but also follow what you hear yeah every time a piece even well known and played often reveals itself differently that's something very meaningful and probably also something that can be disconcerting because we don't know if we are diverging from the point of touching the what it is that we think the piece is, truth or the revelation of it. Or is it just that we feel like we're zigzagging and we're trying a bit this, a slower, faster, this phrasing by this, without pedal, with pedal, the ingredients resonating differently on the statements And all that without to erase the student's own intuitive drive by replacing it or inf over, <laughs> over uh, placing on it um, your know-how or your experience of the piece. I think it should got to be something detailed in the transmission but not in the completion of the performance that should be let the student find enough maturity to filter the different so many elements that they have to think at the same time in order to create this harmonious moment they have to also make their own um, filtering 
their own um, their own sculpting of the musical texture. In fact, the students are the rediscoverers of the treasures which we share when we teach them. They open their hearts, their souls, their eyes without the prejudice of our already previous experience by essence. Does it give them an advantage over us who already have been through these um, experiences of trying to find the meaning of why and how this works? Why are we doing it that way, this temple? Why are we choosing this? color of atmosphere that we think corresponds to the meaning of its message. And uh, it is true that it's um, a real giving and receiving. Because inevitably, when you try to establish the grounds for the choices of the interpretation of a given student's uh, performance of a piece, you give elements, you bring different elements to the table and you say, okay, this will reach this, the pulse, the rhythm, the melody, the polyphony, the chordal progression, the harmonic rhythm, the tempo of the indication, but as well as the choice of the meter and the possible overlapping uh, phrases of um, musical and uh, rhythmic structure. When you have um, a melodic um, line that goes um, overlapping the bars and the pulse as well, and you have a structure of four, six, eight bars in one single real sentence, so that the, the agogic and the expectation of the storytelling is not also organized by the eyes looking at the strict bar separations of uh, the group of beats, uh, which are inevitably um, organized for a practical reason, which is to organize by few, of course, short beats. Um, and then this way you can go quickly to a detail by naming it. That happens mostly when you conduct and you need that because in the rehearsal you have to say start bar this and that. And of course the right hand of the conductor when they are right-handed beats the beats. The individual pulse, uh, well pulse beat is not exactly the same but let's say that if the beat is indicated clearly by four or three or two or an alternation of whatever takes what is in the structure of the expression of the piece rhythmically and, and um, so on. The left hand drives the direction of the line either by holding the phrase, either by dropping, either by asking for more, either crescendo, either diminuendo, either just continue, don't drop, hold, don't, um, don't immediately go to the tension release intuition which in tonal system is the basic breathing of psychological matter. Um, of course you have the dissonance and the consonance and these evolve with the styles. Of course the, <laughs> they are not the same through but um, the perception is that each sentence of of spoken interrupted by rests or even rests interrupting the sounds, um, you enter in a, in a language of a given composer and you want to immerse yourself in the meanings of every detail and then at the same time project it throughout this long line. That's what the conductors do with the other hand, the left for the right-handed which is the phrasing, the direction, the rising or the dropping of the dynamics of the, of the tempo. And then, of course, you have the pulse for the beats. This is mostly because this way you organize that 16 violins play at the same time a dotted rhythm. Ta -tum, ta -tum, ta -tum. Then you subdivide. 
to make sure that there is a precision for the detail while at the same time the phrasing. It's always the two hands in the conductor um, contributing together towards um, the um, pacing of the storytelling. Of course, you have also the problem with the slow tempi. When you have these stretches of phrasing, as if the vowels are lengthened and um, the breathing is delayed because um, the expression touches reflectively our emotions. Whenever the faster tempi are drive, are a drive and are a driven um, uh, energy for the moving forward factors of the music. You play, you do something driven with your fingers, you enter in an energy, in a synergy with the piece that is um, in the reflective slower movements singing-like or um, breathing-like, interrupted-like by rests. Um, and you have to think of it as a very slow stretch, while in order to define how much it stretches in terms of the long values, and then take into account decay on the piano for the sound, um, is subdividing. So when you subdivide something like the slow movement of the tempest, if you conduct it, you have to do a subdivision to make sure that you put the exact amount of space in the rest so when later in the piece you have the decorative 30 seconds notated as such um, arpeggios sorry for the silly singing what I want to say is that this is the moment where you have to be subdividing to keep the spaces exactly as precisely as stretched by the composer's desire, but you have to think of them unsubdivided without which in the phrasing you're going to chop in the small pieces. Ta -ta 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 -ti. Now if you have the same theme in a Faster tempo. You see the pace, the pulse, <laughs> in fact, drives you through the tracks of the piece. But when it is stretched, and and one and 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 for the pianistic touch, for the length of sound of the instrument, acoustic resonance and capacity to connect the singing legato through the energy drive uh, transmission through the knuckles of the tip of the fingers. To shape the phrase. So how do you teach that? Of course you ask them to count loud voice. With a subdivision, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. Or you ask them to use the metronome, which then defines those beats for them cold bloodily, and then the pulse is separate but comes from outer in, since it's somebody else who's counting for you, and then you play the piece and you display its beauties and you stretch its phrases and you go to the highest note you use the dotted rhythm for the tension you don't play too loud the release because it is a shorter note it's a passing tone Tam -pa -da. you can sing it you can guess it you can even um, dream it but when you play it you have to play the first note the long one a little longer to be landing on the shorter without decaying too early without which you're gonna have ta da, da, da which defeats the purpose 
of translating on the keyboard with a decaying instrument, the tension build up on the dotted rhythm to be released by the short rhythm, which lands on the next beat. So it's not about each note, it's about how these three notes tam, ta -ta, will create their um, bridging and their collaboration. So of course it comes in imagination, inner hearing, then anticipated for the pianist's touch to not play too soft the long value to be in order to have enough space left after its decay to connect it with the external node that will come to complete it but very short because of the delay of the dot. These kind of things can be considered detailed and they are and there are many of. And when you have lesser rhythmic um, patterns and um, um, group of notes, like in the opening of this movement, you have a lot of rests between the sounds, which intensifies the reflective effect of it, because it is. And when you have the recapitulation coming in A prime at the end or towards the last third of the piece, with the decorative droppings of cascade of 30 seconds arpeggios, all of a sudden they people all these of original silences or rests or um, sound decays and you realize that in order to have a unity of the pulse you have to take in account the short values that you will play later when you hold or you have rests for the equivalent of the expression of this theme without the decorations so to say naked in the opening and that is, I think, one thing which is very important, is a conductor conducts because they don't play. A performer who conducts himself or herself playing on the piano, they also play. That doesn't mean that they should just follow their fingers, which is what is the big no-no. Rather, they should be able to count inside themselves or loud voice while practicing, and of course not during performance, but in your head. So that you have an independent uh, conductor within yourself while you, you go and you play through all these different um, types of expressions. Because it is true that when it's busier texture or lighter texture, rests that become as meaningful reflective elements as the notes which they are separating or the notes that are interrupting their silences and a beat, a downbeat, and a, a grace note, a comma, a breathing to imitate the voice necessity to, which imitate on the piano without the need to. But you have to in order to bring that belief that um, look alikeness, the repeated melodic notes which are inevitably sung as syllables, which make sense because people don't hear them repeated because of the syllables of the, of the text that is being sung. Whenever when you play, the repeated notes on the piano sound all mechanically tak 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 and not ta ra ra ra. And to replay melodically repeated note with the action of the piano that you have to be able to uh, control enough to replay the note fast deep from three quarters up right away in order to create a continuation of the sound that is repeated, restated without to be re-stricken fully. Ta 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 ta, it means ta ha ha ha. Easy to say? Scary to do. Because we play different pianos every time and inevitably all the instruments are far from there, hardly, I was going to say about both, hardly far from there, respond to our desires. <clears throat> they bite us by not answering like we do, expect them to do. So it has to do a lot with um, speed of deep um, dropping of the finger from not th but three quarters up of the key or two thirds before the sound stops so that you can re-strike it and you hear a resonance that is in fact reconnected to, to last a little longer. Ta -ha -ha. This kind of um, vocal imitation of the piano 
which is used by so many composers from so many different stylistic periods, is a, is a sort of a translation of um, what is the experience of playing piano. It allows you with your two hands and your ten fingers, hopefully enough of a brain to organize all these, play a very complex amount of structures that are superimposed, layered in dialogue or in sometimes uh, are, if artistically the piece demands that and very often that is the case um, in, uh, uh, in fight with each other, in collisions, in fragmentations, it, in um, re, uh, reshuffling of their statement, not always the melodic aria with the accompaniment or, or four voices of a fugue that are completely independently um, not only equals but also um, inter interacting playfully, overlapping or um, crossing each other and so in order to manage all these um, texture even if it's a simple song accompanied with one hand and the other doing one and the other, or if it's a six-voice fugue by Bach, or a complex symphonic type writing like Brahms on the piano music uh, from his early years, symphonic pianism, you realize that at least one thing you don't have to deal with is intonation because the piano is tuned before you play it. So you're not responsible for your intonation, but what you're responsible is how you manage the length of the sounds. How do you introduce the breathing, besides the rhythmic indication in the score about it, in the um, psychological expression of the thematic material? It's not just um, reciting the notes and the rest correctly, it's giving them a meaning with the impulse. If it's an upbeat, how does it land on the downbeat? How heavy is the downbeat or how rebouncing is the downbeat? If you start on the downbeat and that's what the composer wants you to do, it's more grounded, so you have to really take it in account for your dynamic range, for your voicing, for your pedaling, for your harmonic progression. What type of progression is it in terms of is it by beat, by bar, by half bar? Or when does it accelerate if all of a sudden is by eighth note? And these kind of things happen to be part of the expressive um, repertoire of the composers and um, they don't only do one element or another, they combine them in the piano because the piano is sort of a reduction of a symphony, a reduction of a quartet, a reduction of an aria with orchestra, a reduction of an opera with group of voices and orchestra, a reduction of a sacred piece like a mass or a passion by Bach or um, a requiem um, which brings you then the choir plus the orchestra and possibly the soloists and uh, with the pedal and the length of sound uh, of modern pianos and the cross-strung uh, system of um, the strings, you get to the point where you can express such a large variety of um, different genres that you do through the piano. Of course it's reduced, that's why they call it often reduction rather than transcription, but I'm not sure that the one is derogatory and the other one is correct. I think in a way it is more like a parallel option of um, being able to handle a piece that takes 80 musicians or 100 musicians by yourself. That is something that, of course, is not natural because it's not meant for that when the composer imagined their piece, if you transcribe on the piano a symphony or a mass. But what it does is beyond the capacity to be able to perhaps handle it in a way that you can rehearse it if it's ballet and you don't need to have the orchestra every time, that is or the same with the opera, is the practicality of the reduction. But when it becomes an artistic statement on stage where you evoke the piece like Liszt used to do with his paraphrases, um, loosely based on a 
famous tune of the day, would it be an opera by a ballet, and um, then uh, it becomes a paraphrase, it's a restatement. And so it becomes a parallel piece to the original piece that has, of course, the flavor of it, but it's through the instrumental um, outpour of your fingers playing the piano, you reach another dimension of the skeleton or the coating of it or its um, um, charm or strength or drive or drama or peaceful or whatever it is that you feel like spiritually uplifts you towards it. And I find that the transcription should not be the echo of a piece. It should be a parallel um, point of view of the piece that is not competing to be the piece, nor is it trying to be different. It's just um, um, going to the essence of it, of the piece to start with, and is bringing it through your own, let's say, pianism. And that is more like... Um, something where the evocative power of the piano um, of course doesn't replace a soprano voice, an oboe, a clarinet, a bassoon, a string orchestra section, because you n realize that the piano is monochromatic instrument, it has one single color, it's the piano timbre if you call it timbre or color. But with shadow and lights, with pedal, with articulations, with capacity of voicing within the same hand several elements, so you have at least three or four going on if you want to um, really go in depth, in subtle um, um, way of displaying these elements, then you reach the point where the evocation of the piece is as importantly strong, meaningful, compelling, inspirational, um, more as if you extract the essence of this richness of the orchestral timbre um, feast into something more like a black and white photography or um, a film um, where um, you're less distracted by the colors which are natural to the fact that this is how nature is, if you feel nature. But if you do the black and white, you then focus more on the quality <coughs> of the shadow and the lights, how you present them, how you instrument them to convey your message. Um, and I find that is like calligraphy. This is like um, any art form which evokes another art form. You imitate the birds on the piano by singing um, um, the imitation of their song, but they're not the one, even if you are very close to them in terms of pitch, intonation, and the type of trill or repeated note that they do when they communicate with their song among themselves. So yes, you evoke it without the meaning, because inevitably it's like playing without the syllables of the opera singer's uh, song or the aria of the, or the art song. So what do you evoke? The atmosphere that the music itself is bringing you towards, inevitably through the lyrics for the songs, arias, operas, art songs, pop songs, any form of... Uh, sung music with lyrics, poetry or just song lyrics. Both and all are there together in a way of conveying towards each other. And when you extract the sound from the verb and you only play it on the piano, inevitably without the words, and people don't know the original song, so they cannot say, oh, I hear it in my head because I know it and I like it on the piano as an echo of the song I know. No, it becomes a piece separately on its own where the sounds, the harmonization, the melodic um, shape suggests with the rhythm, the pulse, the pedal, and you're playing basically the way you bring it alive. They're more suggestive without to be precisely naming the words of, of um, atmosphere where certain words come, come, could come to mind. 
it's peaceful, if it's driven, if it's dramatic, if it's exactly um, ecstatic or exhilarated or absolutely impatient of, or anxiety driven. These elements of psychological nature are so more suggestive than only the words that are sung through the aria expressing what the character in the libretto is to be singing in the opera section in order to create an atmosphere where they reflect upon where they are in the uh, plot or um, the action itself. Not always a recitativo but also a song recitative or a Sprachgesang, the song spoken. And I find that parlando, as we say in Italian for the pianist touch, is more air, air legato articulation on each note as if you speak. In other words, you articulate syllables, consonants and vowels and organizing um, resonance through your um, um, throat, nose, um, um, uh, all of your um, skull and your um, um, vocal um, cords, you express yourself. High pitch, low pitch, modulating, singing, vibrato, or just flat. You have ways to, to bring the point of a melodic line in its different, um, different meaning, because inevitably when you sing, it's all about the lyrics who justify or the expression of the melodic choice of the gesture, the leap or the uh, step motion or the whatever um, vocalese style um, um, singing you do is because you either enhance the meaning of the of the lyric or, or the lyrics or you um, the opposite you you sing something that suggests psychologically difference and that you're distantiated with the point of what you're saying. It's not just reflecting in a, in a way to mimic through music the words, but to have the music on a secondary distant degree react in a perhaps ironic or philosophical or a um, distantiated way from the words that um, the music is conveying through the singing pattern of holding vowels and uh, clearly re-articulating consonants so you can understand what's been sung. The art of um, being eloquent in the articulation, in the piano playing of a piece not written for piano, I think can be drawn as a parallel to the art of teaching a piano piece to a student that for the get-go of the situation, the student is discovering the piece and you as a teacher are rediscovering the piece. So in a way there is a transcription um, a parallel with the pianist student um, bringing his or her own expressive means into what they think the piece is supposed to be needing of those in order to express its full, at, at its fullness, its um, narrative storytelling power of inspiration. And um, when you start correcting them, then you start telling them compared to what it should be, which you define, since you have the experience, the tradition, at least one of the traditions, and uh, the one that you are convinced is the certain truth for the piece, even if I'm not going to go philosophic into universal truth, but let's say that there is some kind of a exchange between the student asking, is that the right tempo, is it the right phrasing, is it supposed to put pedal, I'm supposed to play the repeats? Even those basic factual questions are impactful in the structure of the construction of the storytelling and how you organize the whole richness of the elements that are there. I mean, it's not just a yes or no answer to these factual questions. It's to incorporate them in the whole structure of what you want to do when you go from point A to point B or point C in the sections of the piece. How you're going to um, 
use the tempo as a structure of expressing the elements of which are thematically in the score that you play from the notes that you read, but that you organize in the way that they bring a meaning, a sense that talk to you um, and that in fact are meaningful to you so, of course, you can argue that this publisher has an indication that is closer to what the teacher thinks is the authentic desire of the composer, but that is, in a way, a lost battle because everybody, in a different way, tries to convince you that for the same piece, it's different ways, with the same conviction that they have. So, it's easy for a student to get lost in translation, thinking, okay, if they don't agree, even about pieces written centuries ago, for which so much study has been done by now between articles and educational um, books um, um, as well as um, uh, published uh, scores to play with different um, authenticities um, being um, demonstrated by the various um, editors, musicologists and scholars. So you enter in a, in a subjective point of view the right tempo, the right phrasing, the breathing, the upbeat, the downbeat, the delay, the type of grace note, the rhythmed or not rhythmed ornament, the decoration and its meaning compared to the melodic real notes that are here and there. Do you extract them or do you enhance them? Do you just blend them? Do you make it so that your statement is as close to the piece and without so much overwhelming layer of your own expression over it? Or do you allow a certain dosage that is considered good taste, and that's in the eye of the beholder, of involving yourself in the accelerando or in the ritenuto, perhaps overreacting it and overstating it according to another point of view, which would be the piece it has all of it in it notation. Therefore, if we just bring it objectively as close as possible to objectivity, to life, then this is how the piece in a craftsmanship approach is supposed to sound by itself once all the elements are put rightfully together artistically. Instead of we rethinking the artistic element from the ground up and saying, no, I want to do this tempo, this overdotting of the rhythm because it's more dramatic and I'll put the pedal this and there and even if I get this dissonance that created, is created by the pedal, I like that because it gives me a sense of vibrato that I don't have in the decay of the instrument. You can justify argument, um, um, suggest influence, give examples, play to the student your own way of going through the section of the piece or the sections of the piece. How much of this stays with the student and becomes their own conviction, in turn teaching it or by then filtered through their own experiences of the piece itself, uh, as a performer and teacher themselves, or recording um, it, or writing about it. I think that that's where teaching reaches a little bit of a dead end, because on one side you can say, this is what it means to me, and you play it for them in the example that you can give of the piece. And that can either attract the student, either perhaps um, find it unattractive and say, I don't like it that way. I heard it such and such playing it this way, and uh, because today the uh, access is so marvelous, a variety of people uh, having played the piece that you can hear while you're practicing it, besides your teacher's opinion about how to organize all of it into your playing. So either you convince them by the example, either you convince them by the explanation the structure, the meter, the tempo indication, the patterns, the reliability to um, um, performing it in a certain aspect of its presentation compared to other pieces of the same composer that have similar um, elements of this toolbox um, of um, pianistic aspect or musical aspect and then the um, uh, whole ethics about being the most closest honest to the original earnest next to the original intent of the composer compared to the having learned what is the stylistic truth or um, the, the point of view of the modern instrument if it was written for an ancient instrument how do you make this 
already interpretation means translation. So if you translate through the instrument, you translate through the phrasing, you translate through the articulation, you translate through the action of the hammer instrument to start with, plus the pedals, you have leverage and you can shape or uh, shape differently. So if you can convince a student um, with a certain logic about the structural organization of these elements for the statement that is the one of the piece, or within the piece, then you reach a point where either you puzzle the student who says, yes, but I don't feel it like this, I don't hear it like this, I don't like it like this, or I cannot play it like this now because I have to practice to see if I can get to that. And then you have to find the fingering, the disposition of the hand, the anticipation of the gesture so that you don't miss notes um, randomly or become uh, worried more about playing it than how you will play it in order to have a portion of it in the um, muscular memory of your cognitive knowledge of the piece so that you can, while played, still think about organizing your structure. You don't have to connect with another musician like in chamber music and not be together if you decide to make a rubato. You don't have to organize a group of 16 violins playing together a rubato in subdividing to precisely make it so they don't sound like they don't play together. Because you're just alone and therefore impulsively, intuitively, structurally alone. Even if the structure of the piece is clear to you, you can still impulsively make a little more ritenuto, a little more accelerando the first time you play it, or the second, or the third, or the hundredth, or whatever. Every time you go through, you try to organize and settle the rules so that once you go through the piece for the performance, you have certain kind of uh, ground on which you're solid. That's very um, um, much the purpose of repetitive practicing is to sort of secure by muscular memory a certain amount of elements that um, you want to have a certain control over. Well, you hope to, because that's the whole point of practicing and while how you practice intelligently, which dotted rhythm, which repeated notes, which articulations, what wrist position, count loud voice, under tempo, so that you don't have to do also care for the gestures not. In other words, it's all these elements of the practicing compared to the performing which happens once through and happens with unexpected situations, either because of the technique that fails you or the instrument that surprises you or your nervous uh, situation playing in front of people feeling uncomfortable and because it's vulnerable and placing yourself in the vulnerability while you are to be structured, to be organized, to be built as if you start from scratch the piece every time you play it, which it is in a way. So it's an ephemeral one more th time through creation of the piece, a recreation of the piece, recreation of its blossoming harmonies, of its unforgettable melodies, of its driven rhythmic patterns, of its pulse, of its pedal, of its drive, of its accelerando, of its ritenuto, whichever rubato kind of sections. How does it make it that the structural organization is also the detailed playing of organizing every anticipated gesture, some muscular memory, some just on the spot. And sometimes the problem is that it takes so much incredible concentration to be constantly ahead of what you play, even if it's by a beat or a bar, to anticipate and therefore try to avoid the collisions on the speed, especially when the tempo is faster is that you have to be always in an incredibly intense, consistent and very high level of concentration. And the slightest drop of concentration that happens after a certain amount of time on stage or during the piece, if the piece is three or four movements, 30, 40 minutes music, it's inevitable that most of the time you'll have droppage of the intensity of the anticipated and concentration for all the details that have to happen to be happening. You plan, you practice, and you go with the sections like an obstacle course and um, you get frustrated when you miss some, you get frustrated when you miss somewhere you've never missed and you feel like why am I doing this and you feel um, discouraged profoundly feeling like all these hours that you spent 
thinking that you'll solidify that muscular memory in order to um, have it just play while you organize how to, on the stage, dealing with the unexpected of the moment, is betraying you and you feel like you're driving and you're upset that you're having these bumps on the way on your car. But you're bringing yourself and the piece for the audience and um, the meaning of the musical expression, the piece from point A to point Z, if it were the beginning to the end, regardless how short, long, or structural in one or in many movements or sections it is. And then you reflect upon the fact that during the performance, your awareness of what you hear, what you monitor, what you control, what you don't really control, or where and how, which section, it's like going through a path every time with different situations, perhaps sunny, perhaps rainy, perhaps... Uh, so you have to go through the piece again and again and again through different situations of instruments uh, on which you play, people who hear you, that you're afraid of their opinion or you're hoping for their honest judgment, but you're also fearing it. And so there is a desire and a hope and a fear and a desire to do well, to do the best of what you've practiced because you want to serve the peace how you love it. You don't want to betray your practicing. You don't want to betray the peace. You don't want to betray um, people's trust in you to play it well. Um, so you build up a certain elevated level of pressure, stress that comes to you when you have to go through the piece again, as if a painter has to repaint, a sculptor re-sculpt every time the piece, every time people look at it. That's not possible. For music it is, especially performing art, even if it's notated as much possible as we think the notation is detailed. There is all this room when you bring it alive between the beats, around the beats, over the beats, under the beats, we're somewhere <laughs> between the notes on the score where the statement becomes the reflection of your personality of the in the piece. Even if you try to hold back from overwhelming it with it, it is your temperament after all. And it is your temperament meeting the temperament of the expression of the piece. And if you find a truth in which you reflect yourself, we you go, oh, this is what it means. It means that to me too. The composer felt this about tragedy or about excitement or about reflection, just like I do. And some composers, you don't understand how they what their musical language conveys in the humanity section of the understanding level of the piece, not just the technical or the just the recited statement. It's what does it mean? What does it mean to them? What are they translating through their music uh, of the human experience that I'm supposed to be the uh, transmitter of? Or, or the, I have to vibrate exactly how they did, how they heard, how they felt, how they imagined, how they um, projected themselves outside of their own time bubble in today's time bubble. And so inevitably we had assume we um, we like to think that we understand better because of this or that. And I think that, yes, you have to play with a conviction during the performance and you can change mind for the next performance or it can take decades. But it's okay because it's a human experience itself. The living, um, breathing, um, thinking, uh, reflecting, um, um, learning, discovering, um, Get, getting in depth in the knowledge of the philosophy of the statement that you're playing varies in, uh, from the intuitive to the learned or both and mostly the learned but keeping some of the intuitive as you age and it becomes a good partner for the life strip in music this piece uh, that you play it or teach it of course when you play it you don't react with the alterity when you teach it you do work with the alterity the student is the other you don't want to bring them to become your point of view of the piece. You want to bring them to elements of your conviction in the piece that make you do it in a certain way. This rubato, this accelerando, this way the coda, this way the recap. Um, and um, I think it's um, very subtle and to have to be very respectful. Um, connection with the students point of view of the piece. You can argue with them and tell them you're wrong, you're not supposed to be that, you're 
or you're right, but you don't have the right tools to express it the way you would like it. Let me help you find the fingerings that correspond to this tempo, the um, shiftings, how to play the bass note compared to the harmonic pedal um, that is uh, holding with the foot pedal, but then there are pages of the chordal elements of the harmonization. In other words, it's not just a one way, it shouldn't be in my opinion, of play it like I do, because I am wise, I've been through it, I know it, I don't have to explain, just do. Or I'll explain some of the elements that bring me to do it this way, to think it this way, to count it that way, to breathe it that way, to um, sing it that way, to imagine it that way, and not the other way, or the other ways, of course. And um, now that's more difficult because not every aspect of the choice of your interpretation is um, you're not always prepared as a performer to give a rational musicological um, or um, uh, music theoretical uh, explanation. You sort of respond to your own intuition and you grow up by learning from learning from the, your own teachers, learning from other persons performing it or reading about it, becoming knowledgeable, but ultimately it's still your in intuitive intensity that drives you to continue. If not, you'll give up saying, hey, there are too many opinions, I have none, so let me give up. No, it's that I am, despite of what I'm told, I will still continue loving it the way I do, because I think there is something there that means to me more that way. Now, it's not a question of being arrogant as a teacher to impose or as a student to be arrogant to reject or perhaps politely accept but not do, which is fine because a student learns here and there a little from different situations, people, places. It's not just a straight piping uh, <laughs> um, fluid that goes from the teacher's knowledge to the student uh, seeking it. I think it's more about um, bringing a student to express themselves at their fullest within what your opinion as an experienced teacher is the stylistic frame. But not to lock them in that frame because if they are trying to think outside of the box differently, before you reject you have to think, okay, perhaps if you do this it will lead you to that, then you have to do this. And so you involve all the elements of the performance of the articulation to the detail, to the structural organization of the whole. How you count it, how you breathe it, how you sing it, how you attack it, what kind of dynamic ranges you're going to use with the tempo, what kind of... Um, um, elements you want to bring in the play so that the drive that you receive from the written text becomes a, such a compelling, believable and inspirational because you're inspired. And regardless if people say, I don't like the way you play, well, it's too bad. Play it yourself and do it the way you like it. But let the person who is different from you student, colleague, or um, anybody who, even if you don't play and you like it through somebody else is playing, um, let remain, if you can, that's the hardest, tolerant. Allow the piece to be differently meaning to different people. Respect it. Try to be convincing. Don't lose your convictions. And um, ultimately, we serve the same purpose, which is the same muse. 